Welcome to this week's episode of The Dream Farm. And uh, we're going to talk about the journey that I went on when I put together my first dream farm. I'm working on number two right now. Uh, but number one was starting from scratch, basically. And Ethan is in that position now where one of his driving goals financially is to figure out a way to buy his first farm and someday create you know, his own dream farm. And we're gonna go through my whole journey. Uh, he can ask me any questions along the way that strike him. So it's gonna be more of a conversation between he and I, but it's, it's gonna to touch on a lot of the key points that go with you know, deciding what to buy, figuring out how to buy it, you know, what to do to improve it. If you need to uh, uh, you know, sell one piece to buy another piece, how do you do that, when, uh, et cetera. So there's a lot of strategy that goes into this, but it's all fun. Um, and there's stuff that, that uh, you know, I can teach Ethan and hopefully you know, some of the audience as well. But real quick, um, so Dream Farm now has two sponsors. And I'm going to keep adding a few more. Um, I have to make enough money that I can pay Ethan so that Ethan can make enough money to buy his dream farm. So by supporting our sponsors, you're indirectly helping this young man to fulfill his dreams. Uh, but anyway, uh, uh, Hunt Stand has come on board with us. They have an app that um, allows you to map your property. It's really good for somebody who has a specific spot that they hunt, you know, like a permission farm or the, the land that they own. It's really set up uh, with a lot of tools for the landowner. Uh, they've got a, a subscription called the Pro Whitetail. It has a lot of additional information that predicts activity times and so forth. So that's pretty cool. We'll be looking at that quite a bit as the year goes on. Uh, but in Hoyt Archery, you know, Hoyt's been a really good supporter of everything that I've done. So. Uh, We've got two sponsors. We'll add probably a couple more, uh, hopefully before too long, and uh, keep this fella moving toward his dreams. Uh, but so I'm going to set this egg timer for 15 minutes. Uh, you hear 15 clicks, hopefully. Okay. There you go. Start. So when, when this thing goes off, we're going to wrap up at that point. So rather than trying to figure out how many episodes we're gonna do, what the topics are gonna to be. We're just gonna kinda of let this go like free form. And when the 15 minutes is up, we're gonna stop there, wrap up, and then we'll move on to the next episode from there. But we're gonna to try to go through this whole journey of getting from where basically I started with $12,000 in the bank, my wife and I, and we ended up with almost 1,000 acres of land. You know, it took a while. And it wasn't like there wasn't additional income that we had to put into that too along the way. It's not like somehow $12,000 magically bought you know that much land, but that was the starting point. So it's not like you have to have you know a small fortune in order to get started. Um, you just have to have a plan and you've got to get into it. So uh, this whole journey is, is kind of the one that Ethan's getting ready to go on. My goal is that by the end of this summer, uh, Ethan owns something. That would be awesome. Okay, so that's <laughs> going to be the goal. So you don't have a choice now. We're committed. You're committed. I'm committed, yeah. I'm, <laughs> I'm all in for that. He's all in. So it started for me, um, and, and I'll, I'll begin just my own journey, and then Ethan can jump in. And, and, uh, but it started for me in 1995 when we bought part ownership in a subchapter S corporation in Southern Iowa. And it was a really big property that had, at that time, 13 owners. And I think we had 35 or 3,600 acres deeded, and we had another 400 acres that bordered us leased. So we had over 4,000 acres that, uh, or right around 4,000 acres at our disposal. And, and you know, it, it was a no-brainer, really, if you could figure out how to come up with it, because there weren't hardly any bow hunters on there. I was mostly gun hunters, and back then land was so cheap. Um, you could buy what would be called recreational land now for, in some cases, under $300 an acre. You know, 300 to 350 would buy most of it in southern Iowa during that time. So it wasn't like it was a fortune to buy in. A full ownership share, one thirteenth, was $80,000. And 
you know, obviously we didn't have that. We had $12,000. So uh, we bought half of a share and I found a buddy to go in with me to buy the other half. So we had to figure out how to come up with 40 grand. And banks don't make loans to purchase uh, shares of stock. If we'd have been buying that acreage outright, you know, or some fraction of that property outright, the banks would have loaned money on that. But we were buying part ownership in a subchapter S corporation, so we were buying stock. So it was a personal loan. It wasn't a, a ag loan or a, you know, a traditional you know, land uh, supported loan. Uh, so I signed for it. You know, my sister, she signed for it. And she put up her Ford Explorer as collateral. So the <laughs> bank, had, in order to loan us, what would that be? $28,000, I think we put up 12 grand. In order to loan us $28,000, they wanted you know, our signature, my sister's, to guarantee it, and uh, the collateral of her Ford Explorer. So that was how we got started in 1995. Um, so I think the point is, it doesn't have to be a fancy starting point. You know, mine definitely wasn't. So, you know, Ethan, I'll even ask you, like, what, what do you think you have to do to get going? I mean, what is, what is your starting point? Uh, you know, and again, like I said, one option is to have a partnership and that's, I think the worst option because, you know, there's problems that come with that too. You know, you get, anytime you've got multiple owners on one piece of land, you know, that's going to cause some friction, but in some cases there's no other way. There's no other way to get started. Um, so what, what do you think you can do? I mean, what is your like starting point? Well, I think the biggest challenge that I run into or really anyone who's buying land runs into is. A 20% number right away. So, Is it, it's even 25, I think. Yeah. I think so, most banks, they even say 25%. And where we hunt, you know, land is going for north of six, $7,000 an acre. To have any amount of land and being able to afford 25% of that right off the bat when you're 21 years old or 25 years old, you know, that's, that's like the most intimidating part for me. But, you know, what do I got to lose, I guess, is my thing. You know, they're really not going to take anything from me. And if, if anything, I can just sell it like we've talked. But Yeah. Yeah, see, that's, that's kind of, you know, I always tell people to take risks when they've got nothing to lose. Um, you know, it's, it's tougher when you get older and you've got a family and you've got, you know, more people that are in the canoe with you, you know, to be shooting the rapids, you know. But when you're by yourself um, and you're young, it's like, it's kind of a no-brainer if you can get there, you know, on the down payment part. Uh, the worst-case scenario is you got to sell it, you know, because unless the economy completely collapses, there's going to be a market for it. Um, and, and ideally, you know, we can talk about that. But ideally, your first one that you buy, you buy at a pretty good price so that it's got some value in it, so that you know you're not sticking your neck out trying to start with the dream farm. You know, you got to start somewhere with something and the ideal starting point is something that you've got maybe a little bit of equity in right out of the box. Uh, something that's got timber value that you can claim or for some reason or another it's, it's priced maybe under the market or you know, maybe it's just a little bit rough and you gotta do some work on it in order to make it, you know, polish it up a little bit and make it more, uh, you know, more valuable. You don't really wanna step in at the beginning um, buying something that's at the top of the market. You know, you, you don't start with your dream farm uh, unless, you know, you were born in the right family and <laughs> you can do that, but most people can't. You're going to start with something else, something that you can um, use as a stepping stone to work your way up. Um, so let's look at your situation then. Let's say, because you've even talked about maybe trying to buy like a 40 or something like that that had a house on it and then being able to claim, uh, you know, first time home, homeowner, because uh, there's some assistance for that, right? Yeah, there's, again, they're secondary loans, like the FHA has them where you can get like three and a half percent down payment, but it has to be your primary residence and you have to live there for 12 months. And then, you know, I don't know how the land, what would be considered like an acreage is I think 10 acres. I think in Iowa, I don't know if it's all over the place, but I think they consider the house in 10 acres 
when they're giving out loans for homes. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, that would be an option just to get something with, you know, use an FHA loan, being able to get in at three and a half percent. Other than that, you know, three and a half percent down, three and a half percent down. Yeah. 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 But I mean, then your payments would be higher and, you know, interest rates are high right now or higher than what they have been. But, you know, I think like a a good goal for me would be like 40 acres. You know, that's something it's not big, but it's like you said, getting equity in there. And it would have to be a good buy. You know, it's Mm -hmm. I'm not going to buy something at the top of the market simply because I can't afford it. Right. But if I could just have some 40 acres and then, you know, roll it into something down the line. So let's figure out the numbers on that. So let's say let's say you can get it bought for. I mean, you should be able to buy recreational land for 6,000 an acre, average stuff up, up in this area. Mm-hmm. And different parts of the state would be much less. Different parts of the country would be more or less. So let's just say for the sake of argument, you're looking at $6,000 an acre. So you need, the total purchase price would be somewhere around 240000 unless it has a house. So let's say it does have a house on it. It's an average house. Maybe it's worth hundred grand. Mm-hmm. So you're at 340000 Say you can take the house in 10 acres out and do your, you know, your smaller down payment on that. Um, so let's just say, what would that be? 100,000 for the house and 10 acres at 5,000 an acre is 150,000. No, yes, 150,000. You said three and a half percent. So you have to come up with, what would that be? Gosh, I wish my brain was faster. <laughs> it wouldn't be. Hundred and fifty thousand. What what would four percent would be six thousand, right? Four percent? So you only have to come up with like six grand then. Does that sound right? I could do that. Yeah. <laughs> so there th- then you gotta come up with twenty five percent on the rest of the thirty. Yeah. Right? So then you're looking at thirty acres at what do we say? Five thousand or six thousand? Just go five thousand. I mean Okay. Hundred and fifty thousand dollars more. Um, so then you've got 25% on that, so you're looking at another almost 40. So you're looking at 37, let's say. So 37 and what did we say, six? Mm-hmm. So you're looking at 42,000, $43,000 to get in. So that's, that's sort of like if you, if you use your strategy and say, hey, I'm gonna you know, move there, have a house on there, I'm gonna live there for you know, this time. Um, how does a kid your age get $42,000? The lottery. <laughs> <laughs> so that really is the whole summary of, of this episode is, you know, play the lottery and get lucky. But so, so there has to be, I mean, I know you've been working a lot and saving money. Um, you know, can you save 10 grand a year? Yeah. So then let's say, you, can you save 20 grand a year? Well, I saved about you know, 30, I try to save about 70% of my paychecks last year. Well, you're living at home, right? Living, yeah. Well, I have a, a place on my own. Yeah. yeah, okay. So, I mean, that's like really my only expense is rent. Yeah. And, you know, so I'm lucky that way. You know, I don't have a lot of expenses. So, after now. taxes and everything, you should be able to save somewhere in the neighborhood of 20 grand a year yeah. living like that. So, within two years, so you're, this year is the year. Mm-hmm. That's the plan. Yeah. I mean, that's why I have, <laughs> it's like, that's the only reason. You know, I want to, you know, work is to be able to buy land. <laughs> I mean, eventually, you know, somewhere down the line, I'll have to probably find a place to live maybe. Or... Well, that's it. I mean, find the one that you can live on. Um, then you take advantage of that opportunity with the first time homeowner. Yeah. So anyway, the point is you got to start somewhere. So that might be Ethan's starting point. Mine was the, the partnership. And, you, you know, we'll go back to my journey now. Um, so the, we were in that... In fact, we had to move there and live there because we couldn't afford to make the payments on that loan, that $28,000 uh, loan. I can't remember what the payments were and then still pay rent someplace else. So we actually moved onto the property and took the role of, of managing the land. That was our, instead of paying rent there, uh, you know, I had to do all the, the work. You know, I had to plant the food plots and you know, keep the trespassers away and all that kind of stuff. You know? So it was... That was how we made it work. Um, and then eventually, you know, the savings caught up, my income started to catch up a little bit, and then we were able to pay that off. And then to save up enough money, <clears throat> excuse me, and, and we bought a house in Michigan. And uh, we moved away, and that was back when it was a little bit easier to get 
uh, tags to hunt Iowa as a non-resident. So we weren't super worried about it. There was a little bit of a loophole there, and I stayed in contact with the DNR um, you know, all the way up through the Enforcement Bureau. I knew all those people, and then uh, we lived in Michigan for four years. Real early in that process, the, the interpretation of the law changed in Iowa. It used to be if you had a voter's registration in Iowa, it was like a lifetime hunting license. That's all you needed. So they, they told me, and I talked to the, the people at the, you know, the Voting Records Bureau in Iowa too, and I said, well, what do I need to do? And they kind of went through their list of stuff. I'm like, well, I can do this. So I felt like my voter's registration was my loophole. Well, they closed that loophole about a year after we moved. So I lost my opportunity to hunt in Iowa, even though we owned all that land. You know, I couldn't draw the tags you know, every year to come back and hunt it. So we decided that it'd be best um, you know, for our family and, and otherwise just to move back. And uh, you know, we, we didn't have a, a very good active market for that house in Michigan where we lived. So we moved back um, and bought some land that was near that corporation farm. It was about a mile as the crow flies away. And, you know, it was a pretty good neighborhood, obviously. I mean, if you've got a property that big, it's exporting bucks. I mean, everybody around there is going to be, you know, having a lot of fun. Um, and, and that property that we bought was 125 acres with a house on it. But now, you know, we got a loan on that. Well, the bank wouldn't even give us a loan on that because we still had the loan on the house in Michigan. So we're, we're trying to float basically a lot of stuff with a bare... You know, I won't say a minimum income, it kept growing a little bit every year. You know, I was writing for magazines back then, and I could continue to find more and more work, so my income was growing, but it wasn't like a big income by any means. So the guy that owned the house, he decided, Larry Kendall was his name, he decided that he would go along with it and just you know, sell us the house on contract because the bank wouldn't loan us because we didn't have good enough you know, uh, income to loan ratio, of whatever they look at. So it was too risky for them. Um, so then eventually the house in Michigan sold, and then we were able to uh, transfer all of our energy then into paying Larry off, and we got that, I think we got that loan paid off within our contract period of whatever it was, three to four years. But during that whole time, I'm seeing lots of big deer in that area where our house was at. And I'm thinking, oh, there it is. So we're coming to the close of episode number one. So, the, so let me summarize by saying um, we ended up selling out of that corporation farm and buying more land that was near our house. But we'll come back and talk about that process in the next episode uh, because everything you do with respect to land, you have to think your way through it because sometimes there are, there are tax laws that help you um, and sometimes they don't. You know, an understanding, you know, how to position uh, properties, you know, as far as, you know, whether you can do a, a tax exchange, um, all that kind of stuff becomes really relevant. And we're going to dive into that in the next episode. But um, for now, at least, um, we got our starting point. You've got my starting point, and you've got Ethan's plan for his. So we'll see you right back here. Uh, I'm not sure when the next one will release. I'm going to try to release these fairly quickly on top of each other. So just keep checking back, and we'll have another one real soon. Uh, thanks for joining us. We'll see you back here soon for the next episode of Dream Farm. And remember to always dream big. <laughs>